I'm delighted to have been asked to give one of the lockdown lectures to tell you a little bit about our research, which for many years has been trying to understand what happens in the brain during a stroke and related conditions. A stroke occurs when the brain is starved of oxygen and blood, or at least parts of the brain have limited blood supply. It's a condition called cerebral ischemia. Of course, the same condition occurs in many different situations. In stroke, most commonly, it's when an artery is blocked by a clot that supplies the brain with blood. But it can also happen when an artery bursts a hemorrhage. Then again, there are situations that are very similar, for example, in babies who are starved of oxygen during birth, called birth asphyxia, in drowning, in heart disease, and also when some people get many, many tiny strokes that result eventually in the condition known as vascular dementia. In fact, all of these conditions relate to cerebral ischemia. But the work we've been doing probably has even wider implications for other brain diseases, as broad perhaps as Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, epilepsy, brain injury, and even psychological conditions such as schizophrenia. So when a stroke happens, the part of the brain that's directly supplied by the blood supply, that's blocked or that's burst, dies very quickly. The brain cells, the neurons, can't live for very long without oxygen, and so they die. But what we now know is that the area of death, the core, if you like, of the ischemic damage, is often very small. And brain, in, brain imaging tells us that larger areas around that core die later, sometimes hours or perhaps even days later. Why do those secondary areas die when in theory they should have enough blood and oxygen to stay alive? What we now know is they're actually murdered by their neighbors. The brain cells, the neurons at the core of the injury release lots of toxins. They also activate other brain cells around them called the glia, Glia were originally meant to be called glue because they stuck the brain together, but we now know they serve many functions, both good and bad. And they also release toxins when there isn't enough oxygen supply. So those toxins then spread out in a wave to kill cells in the surrounding areas. If we could stop those toxins being produced or stop them from acting, then perhaps we could treat stroke and many other conditions. So this was the goal for many years as scientists tried to identify those toxins. They're all things we produce in our bodies. Chemical transmitters that help in signaling between brain cells. Molecules like glutamate and aspartate, without which we couldn't think or remember or even survive. And we all have enough glutamate in our brains to kill all our brain cells many times over. But fortunately, it's very carefully controlled and released in tiny amounts and quickly taken up again back into the glia. But after a stroke, there's catastrophic release of chemicals like glutamate and they kill cells around. So that's been one approach. Another has been to stop the generation of free radicals, superoxides, which kill cells, or stop the iron calcium getting into cells because we know that kills them. Yet, after many decades and many clinical trials, there is still no treatment really to halt the secondary damage that occurs in a stroke. We do have treatments to unblock the artery if it's blocked up, either using an enzyme called TPA or mechanically. And we know that then if it's done quickly enough, there can be very rapid recovery. But why have all those decades of research not yielded a short treatment for stopping the secondary death? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. It could be that the experimental studies were not appropriate. It could be the clinical trials were not conducted in the right way. And we certainly know that some of the trials use much, much lower doses than were used on experimental animals. So perhaps it's not surprising that they weren't effective. We also know that some of those treatments are toxic. But also it's quite likely that trying to block what is a normal process that goes catastrophically wrong in stroke is really, really difficult because you need to leave that normal part of the process while blocking the massive release of glutamate or its actions. So instead, we turn to looking at something different, 
something that only happens in disease, something that we've all experienced, a process called inflammation. If you've ever had an infected cut, you'll have seen inflamed tissue. It's red and it's warm because blood rushes to the site to try to stop the infection. More serious forms of in inflammation are seen, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, in, in inflammatory bowel disease, and in psoriasis. And there are anti-inflammatory treatments for all of these. Inflammation is part of the body's defense. It's actually there to stop bugs from attacking us, viruses, bacteria, other bugs. And it's very effective in many cases. But the problem is that inflammation can often go wrong. If it's activated too much or for too long or in the wrong place, then it's the cause of disease. In addition to the classical inflammatory diseases like rheumatism, like psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease, we now know that inflammation contributes to many other diseases. For example, obesity, heart and circulatory diseases, diabetes, and even many diseases in the brain. It is overactivation of that immune defense system that is the cause, it seems, of some of the most serious cases of COVID-19, an inflammatory over-response. So how do we stop that response? Well, we now know that inflammation is caused by a lot of different mediators in the body. Key amongst these are a group of proteins called cytokines. And cytokines are interesting because they're produced in response to disease, but they don't have a function in normal biology. So that could be a useful target in disease. The first cytokine to be discovered, called interleukin-1, or IL-1 for short, was the molecule that was found to cause fever. IL-1 is the reason that we feel so horrible when we have an infection, why we get shivery and a high temperature, why we lose our appetite, and why we feel tired. IL-1 also produces many hormonal changes, largely to help the body to combat infection. But IL-1 is sometimes produced in conditions where it's not appropriate, or it's produced too much, or for too long. And stroke now seems to be one of those conditions. Our studies over a long period of time in Manchester have demonstrated that the inflammatory cytokine, IL-1, is produced in much greater amounts in the brains of animals and people who have a stroke. We also know that when IL-1 levels are even higher, for example, in infection, brain damage can be worse. And it's certainly been well documented that infections make many neurological and psychological disorders worse. Disorders such as Parkinson's and dementia and muscular sclerosis. So how can we stop IL-1 from being produced or acting? Well, we're lucky here because there is a naturally occurring blocker of IL-1, something that our bodies produce, presumably to terminate the IL-1 response. It's called IL-1 receptor antagonist, and its medical name, as it's sold now, is anakinra. Anakinra is already used to treat various conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So we tested it first experimentally and then in patients. And what we found was that anakinra dramatically reduced the damage caused by a stroke and many other insults, at least in the laboratory. Anakinra is fortunate in that it doesn't seem to have any side effects, so it's quite valuable. We then went on to patient studies, and we've carried out quite a number of these, small studies in stroke and also in a brain hemorrhage called subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, the results are promising, but the trials are not yet completed. We were just beginning a larger trial of anakinra in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, but of course that was halted because of COVID-19. We're hoping to come back to it soon. Though now, interestingly, anakinra is showing promise in COVID-19. So our research on interleukin-1 and inflammation in the brain might just lead to a potential treatment to limit damage, obviously in stroke and brain hemorrhage, but potentially in other devastating conditions like dementia, like Parkinson's, and like motor neuron disease. We're continuing that research now in Manchester with many staff and students working on ways of stopping IL-1 being produced, new ways of trying to block its action, 
and also ways of trying to determine which people might be most susceptible to diseases like stroke, perhaps because they have tiny changes in the genes for IL-1 or its naturally occurring blocker. So the story isn't quite over yet, but the research is ongoing and we very much hope to recruit more staff and students to that research. Perhaps some of you will be part of it one day. Thank you.